Smith, raise your hand. Look at that, Brother Barani. Got just about everybody in here. That lady there will, um, I mean, if you raise your hand, or if she overhears you say, well, I've got this hangnail on my pinky toe, now you'll get a card. And there will be scriptures, handwritten, all in that card. On the, I, I was reading a, a letter you gave uh, uh, gave to me recently, and just I think this is about all it said. Here's some scriptures to encourage you, and son, both front and back, just loaded with scriptures, encouraging scriptures. Uh, if anything ever happens to me, Diane would make a great pastor. Okay. Uh, Psalm chapter 46. Psalm 46. Boy, I'm telling you what, he is something else. Psalm chapter 46, and do be praying for Brother Barati. Be praying about your missions giving, giving to uh, uh, the cause of missions. I would love to take on some more missionaries. Brother Nader here is, is the type of missionary in particular I would love to take on. He is ready to go. He's familiar with the culture into which he is going. He's familiar with the, the language. Now, they don't speak Farsi in Ethiopia, right? They speak, you mentioned another language. Uh, do what? Okay, yeah, that's what they speak. Uh, but he'll, So you'll have to do some learning of that, right? A lot of similarities. So, I mean, look, he, he's ready to go, folks. And uh, he's just lacking one thing, the financial means necessary. But I would love to be able to take him, and there's a few others that we've had through that I think would be tremendous to support his missionaries. Um, so let's be praying about that, all right? Psalm chapter 46, let's stand, if we could, please. I'm going to read the whole chapter here, and uh, you follow along with me. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her in that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, he uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder, he burneth the chariot in the fire. Now listen to this verse, here's our text verse, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. Let's pray. Father, once again, thank you for your word. Now, Lord, we need you today. Um, I pray that you would help each of us to be tender, receptive, and obedient to your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated, Psalm 46. I wanna, we've been talking about what uh, are standing in a storm. And boy, those storms of life are going to come. We've talked about the anchors we have, our faith in Christ, our trust, uh, uh, knowing that God will hold true to his promises. And boy, that's an anchor. We've talked about how the fact that I'm a child of God. That's an anchor. Hey, I, the, the one who spoke, and there it was, the one who spoke everything out of nothing, the one who measured the waters in his hands, the one who spangled the night sky with stars and planets, and, and, and he calls them by name, and they sing his praises. That God is my Father, and he knows me personally, and he loves me individually, and he cares about me. He knows more about me than I know. He knows my needs before I know them. So, I mean, wow, what an anchor that is to know that that's my father, and however bad the storm may get, I can hold to him. Well, there's something here that we need to do with a storm. And we see that in Psalm 46, verse 10. He says, be still and know that I am God. The psalmist begins this psalm here by saying that God is our refuge and our strength in a time of trouble. And boy, isn't that comforting to know 
In verse 2, he speaks of the earth being removed. He begins to speak of some situations here, the earth being removed and, and the mountains being carried into the sea. Imagine the violence of an earthquake. Anybody in here ever experienced being in an earthquake? Really? Bless your hearts. Boy, I never had. Well, one time my wife got real mad, and I, I thought, In 1988, two earthquakes hit Armenia, killing close to 60,000 people, destroying nearly a half million buildings. It was 1141 in the morning when the first more powerful earthquake hit three miles from Spitka, or Spitak, a city of about 30,000. Only about four minutes later, uh, a, a tremor of a magnitude of 5.8 struck nearby. And those buildings that had not yet fallen from the first earthquake, the second one did in. In a matter of four minutes, can you imagine? I, now, I've never been in an earthquake. And I cannot imagine what it would be like to be in that environment where all of a sudden the ground beneath you, that which is stable, that which you stand upon, that which you build upon, all of a sudden to feel it become unstable and to begin to shake. I can't imagine what it would be like as you watch the, the, the things in your house begin to swing and shake and fall off the walls and fall off the shelves. I can't imagine what it would be like as the house that you're in, that you, you go to for refuge, for safety, begins to crumble around you. I can't imagine that. But the Bible said, or, or the psalmist here said, even if the mountains were carried to the sea, he says, even if that which is most stable, the most stable thing on earth, the mountains are removed. He says the idea is that any convulsion, any any change, any threatened danger, they would place confidence in God who ruled over all and could not change. He's the one constant we have. In verse number 3, he speaks of the, the roaring waters. The trouble, well, let's look at it there. Though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Anybody here ever been at sea in a bad storm? Anybody been out at sea in a bad storm? Hey, can you uh, imagine, uh, there it says, though the, the waters thereof roar and be troubled. That word troubled, it means to boil, to foam. Now, I've, I've been on the sea when it was a little stormy, and that was bad enough. But I've heard others talk of having been on the sea. My pastor was out um, uh, with some men from our church uh, deep sea fishing one time, and man, a storm came up on them in a skinny minute. They didn't have time to get out of it. And he said the waves were so bad that when the one boat, the boat he was in, would go up on a wave, he could look down on the other boat. And then when that wave would come out from under him and they would go down and the other boat go up, he would actually be looking at the bottom of the boat. I've heard about some going through the breakers and, and a wave hit them and turned the boat totally around in the breakers. Can you imagine as you're on this boat, and, and uh, the waters begin to pitch and toss that boat. Picture the swelling tide as the powerful waves pound against the mountain. Notice it said, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. And that storm begins to brew and the, the, the winds begin to blow and the thunder and the lightning. And, and man, the waves get big and they begin to slap against the, the side of the mountain, the cliff there on the water, and it, and it shakes the cliff. Man, that's pretty scary. And Psalm 124 says, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, now may Israel say, If it had not been the Lord who was on our side when men rose up against us, then they had swallowed us up quick. When their wrath was kindled against us, then the waters had overwhelmed us, the stream had gone over our soul. You see, stormy seas provoke fear even in an experienced sailor. In verse 6, 
we see that the heathen rage and the kingdoms are moved. The nations were moved. There's, there was agitation. There was anger, stability, instability, insecurity. There's war. And then the psalmist points out the mighty power of God. In verse 6, he, the Bible says, The heathens raised, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. That's God. He uttered his voice. The earth melted. Consider the power of God's voice. Hey, look. I'm going to get ahead of myself. Let me not go there yet. The nations were moved. In, in uh, Genesis 1-3, consider the power just of God's voice. When he says, let there be light. And there was light. Consider the power of his voice in Psalm 33-9. For he spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Just at the mention of it, or at the uh, speaking of his voice in Psalm 46, 8 through 10, listen to what it goes on to say there in Psalm 46 we read, Come, behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. And no doubt when David is writing this, he's thinking about some of the stories of the things God did in his past, even things maybe he saw with his own eyes as God fought the battle for him and the battle was won because our God is a powerful God. Then in 46, Verse 10, after he mentioned the, uh, the, the earth quaking and, and though the, the things that are most stable in our life are shifted out of place. You ever felt like that was happening to you? Not necessarily a real earthquake, but an earthquaking event. A life-shaking event. Maybe it's the loss of health. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's the loss of, of, of financial security. But all of a sudden this this little world that you are, are stable and secure in, all of a sudden it has shaken and the foundations seem to be out of place. He said, in that time, in that time where the storms threaten to overwhelm you, when the storms threaten to swallow you up, in the time when the nations are moved, where there's, where there's no security, even in the, the nations, they're at war, they're agitated, there's instability, there's uncertainty. And boy, we're living in that time right now. And in verse number 10, he says, in the midst of all those things, here's what you need to do. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. Three things I want to point out here, what to do in a storm, and this being still, some things it implies. Number one, don't panic. Don't panic. Don't resort to self-reliance or frantic efforts. When I was a kid, I, and I still like to watch it sometimes, the Three Stooges. I was watching an episode one time where Mo, Larry, and Curly... Those were my favorite of the Three Stooges right there. There was also Joe and Shemp, but I, I like Mo, Larry, and Curly. Mo, Larry, and Curly, they're out in a boat. They're fishing, and one of them catches a, a, a big fish. And, man, I, it, it's amazing how fakey it was, but as a kid, I, I really thought it was so realistic. They get this fish, and, and they throw it in the boat, and it's about this big, and this fish starts flopping everywhere. And they're trying to knock this fish out. And so Curly picks up an axe. Now, why he has an axe in the boat, I'm not sure. And he begins to swing at this fish, and it's over here, and he, he begins to chop, and he chops a hole in the bottom of the boat. And Mo and Curly are in the back of the boat doing something, and all of a sudden they, the water's just pouring in, and Mo and, uh, Mo and Larry are back there. Now, they run up here. Curly runs to the back, and, and Mo and Larry, man, they're getting cups, they're getting pots, and they're belling the water out fast as they can. Curly has a great idea. He's looking for something to do, and he finds an auger, you know, a drill, a hand drill. And he said, oh, a water letter outer. He thought, well, if the, if the water's coming in that hole, I'll drill a hole for the water to run out of. 
And he begins to drill holes in the bottom of the boat. And the water's spewing up. And he's drilling. And Mo uh, uh, looks back and he says, What are you doing, you numbskull? I'm letting the water out. <laughs> okay. And before long, the boat sinks. What had they done? Panicked. And in panic, don't we do some of the most stupid things? Oh, I've got to do something right now. I um, had a friend that was in the military. Well, he was an older man, older than I was, but he told a story about um, uh, when he, he was in the Army. And uh, many of you were in the military. How many of you had to go into the tear gas thing? The, you, okay, and you had to take off your mask and, and say whatever it is you had to say. And um, he said, so what you tried to do is before they pulled your mask off, get a, a big breath of good air right then. And when they pulled your mask off, say whatever you, you could say and try to say it and get out of there before you actually had to breathe again. He said, this one guy, he, he just wasn't too bright. And they also told you when you go out and your eyes are burning, don't run, just walk out, stay calm, okay? It'll wear off. So this one guy, he waits till they pull his mask off, and then he says, gets a big breath. Well, son, he begins to cough and hack, and the fluids are running out of his nose and out of his eyes, and he's burning, and finally they say, okay, you can go out, and they open the door, and this guy, he's panicking. Man, I'm, my face is burning. My eyes are burning. I can't breathe. I'm coughing. There's snot coming out every every hole available, and uh, he, he, they open the door, and this guy just takes off running across the base. He's panicked, and he did not see that tree. Then he just ran face first into, bam! When we panic, we forget to rely on God. Isn't it amazing? We, how, how many of you know that God's all-powerful? Would, would you slip your hand? Anyway, how many of you believe God loves you? Okay, how many of you believe God has a plan for you? Okay. And yet... In spite of all that, when the, when the water's pitching us and the earth is quaking and, and everything that we feel safe uh, with is crumbling around us, all of a sudden, oh, God's not doing anything. I better fix it. Anybody ever tried to fix something and made a mess of it? All the time, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am, Miss Julie. There have been times somebody would say, hey, if you'll wait on me, I'll help you with that. And they knew what they were doing, and I would get to think, ah, I can probably fix this. And by the time they got there, there was more to fix than there was to begin with. Tore it up. In Mark chapter 4, verses 37 through 38, the Bible says this, And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. He was in the hinder part of the ship, talking about Jesus, asleep on a pillow. And they awake him and say to him, Master, Carest thou not that we perish? Here's the disciples. They're in a boat with the Son of God. Nothing's going to happen to the Son of God. This is the Messiah. This storm comes up. Now, he, he's down in the, in the boat. He's got his head on a pillow. He's sleeping. He's not panicking. He's the one who created it all. He's not panicking. And the disciples, the storm comes, and man, they're doing everything they can. Can you see them trying to bail out the boat? They've got buckets, and they're scooping the water out and throwing it overboard. And man, the waves are just crashing in, and they're in fear of their life. Can you picture them undergirding the boat, trying to hold it together because the waves are slapping it so hard, and, and they're trying to hold that boat together? Can you picture them as now the boat's filling with water? And they begin to find anything of weight and throw it overboard so they can float a little longer. Man, we're, we're going under it and throw that over and throw that over. Throw that over. Oh, wait, that's one of the disciples. Okay, you stay on here. Throw that over. Can you imagine them beginning to panic? Can you imagine as that boat's pitching back and forth? And that, man, we're going to fall overboard. Here, tie me to this post. I never have understood quite why they do that because if the boat sinks, you're really done for. Can you imagine their panic? They are frantic because, man, there is a storm. 
and they run down into the bottom of the boat. Master, master, hey, hey, Jesus, Jesus, oh, what, you're sleeping. Do you not care that we're going to die? Listen to his response. He steps up on deck and he says, peace, be still. And the wind just turns to a gentle breeze. The waves lay down in obedience. And he says to them, what were you scared of? Uh, what was we scared of? It was a storm. What, what were we scared of? What, do you, look, the boat is full of water. Oh, you have little faith. In John chapter 6, verse 19, so when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh to the ship. They were afraid, but he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. In, in verse number, uh, uh, Matthew 14, 19, so when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh to the ship, and they were afraid, but he saith unto them, It is I, be not afraid. Here they are once again, there's a storm on the sea. And what are they doing? Hey, we can see land. Hey, everybody grab an oar. Let's get to rowing. And, man, they're rowing hard as they can. Hurry, guys, we got to go. Man, this, this storm here is going to sink us. It all looked like it was hopeless until they looked out. Here comes Jesus walking on the water. Child of God, there's no need to panic in the storm. If God is who he says he is, and we really believe that, if my God is an all-powerful God, if my God has a plan for my life, if my God truly loves me, then I can rest in that. I don't have to panic. But things are so bad! Oh, yeah? Do you have to wear camo crocs? You want to talk about bad? No, that's nothing. Preacher, it's so bad, and I, I don't know what to do, and I, I, I'm just, I, I'm so scared. I'm, Look, I understand. Just be still. When Chad and Trent were both very young, we went to Tweetsie Railroad. Anybody here ever been to Tweetsie Railroad? I went as a kid when Fred Kirby was there. You remember Fred Kirby? Anybody remember Fred Kirby? Everybody remembers Fred Kirby? You know how we love little rascals, little rascals, little rascals. How we look? You don't remember that? You people are sheltered, man. Everybody should know Fred Kirby. But I remember we took my boys there, and I, I remember as a little kid, you know, the Indians jump on the pl on the train, and there's the 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 band of thieves that jump on the train. They've got their guns. You know, the bad guys, the outlaws. I remember when the train stopped, and they'll be doing something out here in front of you, and there's some Indians, guys dressed like Indians, and they're doing something out here. And while they're doing that, Indians sneak up behind you and get on the train. And then at whatever their signal is, they all stand up from the little stairway there, and they run down the plane with the, or train with the tomahawks. And so I remember when I was a little kid, I had me a little toy gun. I, well, I was trying to help out them cowboys. So we're watching. We're watching these Indians out there. I have Chad in my arms. Was Trent with us at that time? It may have just been Chad. He's just little. The Indians are getting up on the train. I thought, oh, this is going to be good. And being the good dad I am, I did not prep my son at all. He's about three or four, I guess. And son, at their mark, the Indians jump up on that train, and they begin to hooping and hollering, running down the train. Cowboys chasing, they're firing them guns, pow, pow, pow. And Chad, he's in my arm. Now he's three or four. He's acting like a three or four-year-old. He's in my arms, and he is shaking violently in fear. 
<laughs> and he's crying. He's I'm not talking about a tremor. I'm not talking about just barely. He's shaking violently. It was great. Okay. He, he's, pro he's probably snorting. Here's all I could say. So I held him. And I, I really did feel bad inside a little bit. Now, I felt bad because I did not know it was going to scare him like that. And I held him, and I, I, I pat him on the back. Hey, buddy, it's going to be okay. Just be still. It's going to be okay. I've got you. I'm not going to let them do anything to you. It's fake. They're just acting. Okay? If they weren't, I would be crying and shaking too. Just act. It's okay, bud. Be still. Calm down. That's exactly what God's saying to us. Be still. It's going to be okay. I know it doesn't look like it. I know it doesn't feel like it. And I'm not telling you that the storm is going away right now. I'm just telling you to be still and know that I'm God. Just be still. Not only don't panic, but don't give up in the storm. Just don't give up. In Exodus chapter 14, we see the people of Israel, God has brought them out of Egypt. I mean, the Bible says, with a high hand. I mean, they have a lot of wealth with them. They're gaining their freedom. They will no longer be slaves. They're coming out of Egypt. They get to the Red Sea. And while they're camping there, they begin to feel the earth tremor a little bit. They begin to hear what... It, 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 Dad, is that thunder? No, that's not thunder. It's constant. It's not going away. They look in the distance and they see what looks like a sandstorm. And as they wait and they look, they begin to see little specks on the horizon and they realize that's Pharaoh's army coming after them. There's horses, there's chariots, there's soldiers. The earth, they can feel the earth tremble. They can hear the, the thunder of the horse's feet, the rumble of the chariot's. They hear maybe the, the clashing of swords and shields and spears and helmets. Maybe they hear the shouts of men preparing for war. They began to say to Moses, Moses, you brought us out here to die, didn't you? I mean, I, we, we had all we wanted in there. No, they were slaves. Their children were being killed. And now they're like, look, what are we, we, look, we just might as well give up. There's nowhere to go. Look, there's an army there. There's the Red Sea here. Now listen to what Moses says. Boy, I like this. And Moses said unto the people, fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. You know what he said? He said, hey, don't give up now. I mean, God just gave you a victory. He brought you out here into the desert. You were slaves. But Moses, we're in the desert now. We're not in the promised land. Look, don't give up yet. Don't give up yet. I love that song. There's a line and it says, The darkest hour means dawn is just in sight. It's amazing how we will... We will endure, 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 and if we would just not give up, God has the victory for us just around the corner. He's going to show himself strong. If the children of Israel had given up then, they never would have had the experience of walking across the Red Sea on dry ground. So don't give up. The Red Sea's in front of them, the Egyptian army behind them, there's no place to run. The strongest thing the children of Israel could do right then was just to be still and rely on God to fulfill His promises. That's it. That's it. Just be still. Watch. And by the way, He didn't instantaneously split the Red Sea. All that night, the wind blew. And the water scattered on, gathered on both sides. 
And all that night they're looking there. The, there's a pillar of, of cloud or one side is cloudy uh, towards the Egyptians. It's fire to give light to the Israelites on this side. And, and all night they can hear the armies on the other side over there. And they're, well, well what are we going to do? What's God going to do? They don't realize, hey, he's making a path for you over here. They walk across on dry ground. What did they do? Don't panic. Don't give up. And the third one, just be still. That's very counterintuitive to our society. Our society doesn't have that philosophy of be still. It's be busy, isn't it? It's a busy society. Got to be busy, busy, busy. You got to be doing something. Be productive. Be successful. And yet, the Bible says be still. That being still has to do with our relationship with our God. Listen to Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 42. Now it came to pass as they went that he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving, and came to him and said, Lord, Dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bitter, therefore, that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. Mary hath chosen that good part which shall not be taken from her. Martha is in a storm of sorts. And you ladies could relate to this, right? The company's coming. Any lady can understand the pressures that that causes. Right, ladies? Companies come. And not just any company, Jesus. Can you imagine now? She's running around picking up clothes. Here, throw those somewhere. Put them up. Fold them. Put them in your drawers. And, and oh, where do we put them? Throw them in the garbage can if you need to. Just hide them. Can you imagine she's got a, a, a broom in one hand and a mop in the other, and she's sweeping and mopping? I wish somebody would help me in here. She's got a feather duster. She's dusting the tables, dusting the shelves. She's cooking the food. She's washing dishes. The guests get there. She's serving guests. She's giving them food. She's meeting out the food, and, and she's taking up plates that are used and, and washing them again, and she's pouring drinks. I mean, she's, she's just getting with it. And she looks over, Martha looks over, where is Mary at? And Mary's just sitting down at the feet of Jesus. Just sitting there. Martha's busy in the storm. She's trying to be productive in the storm. She says, Lord, do you not care? Do you not care? Look, would you look at that lazy, good for nothing sister right there? I'm cleaning the house. I'm serving food. I'm pouring drinks. And she's just sitting there. Can't you tell her to help me? <clears throat> and Jesus answered and said to her, Listen now, Martha, Martha, thou art careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. He said, Martha, look. There's only one thing that really needs to be done right now. He said, you're, you're busy, you're cumbered about by many things, you're panicking, you're toiling, you're working, you're uptight. But listen, those things are important, but that's not the main thing right now. He says, but one thing is needful, and Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Well, what was it that Mary had chosen? To be still in the presence of God. As I've said before, look, I, uh, there's a lot of things I can't guarantee, but I can guarantee this. If you live long enough, you're not in a storm right now, there's going to be a storm. There's going to be something come along in life that shakes your securities out of place. There's going to be something that comes into your life that's going to provoke some worry, that's going to provoke some anxiety, it's going to provoke some, some uh, 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 fear. And in that time, we are so, so prone to say, okay, I'll fix this. 
Sometimes it's relational problems with somebody that we really care about. We think, I've got to fix this. And you know what? Sometimes you can't. You ever tried to fix one of those relationships and just made it worse? Yeah. Sometimes you have to step back and say, okay, God, I can't do it. You're going to have to. In the storm, sometimes you've just got to be still. You see, God steps in when everything else is stepping out. God has a solution when everything else says the situation is hopeless. See, God remains steady when everything else has shaken loose. God pulls you closer when everything else is pushing you away been there what was Mary doing Martha in the midst of her storm she's rushing about like a chicken with its head cut off I mean man she is uptight she is not here's Jesus and she's angry because this person didn't help her that person was doing what needed to be done she was just sitting just being still in the presence of God. So I want to give you a little advice from the scripture this morning. When in a storm, be still. Get in the presence of God and be still and know that he's God. And he's bigger than any mountain. He's bigger than any earthquake. He's bigger than any storm. He's bigger than any war. He's your father. Bow your head and close your eyes, please.